Before we get started today, I wanted to share some awesome news with you. Boys and girls, listeners, leaders, and friends, drum roll please, come on. My newest book, the follow-up to On Fire, is called In Awe. And In Awe hits bookshelves in May of 2020. Many of you already knew that this was coming because more than 1,500 of you voted on the cover design. I'm certainly grateful for that. But you may not know what the trigger to write this book was in the first place. Well, I wrote it. The inspiration behind it was for my kids. You see, my kids have inspired me to recapture and to harness my childlike senses of wonder in order to become a little bit more engaged, successful, fulfilled, and joyful in life. In this world of negative news cycles and loneliness as an epidemic, chronic struggle of doing more and more and more with less and less and less, the book In All will provide us the tools to help us rediscover the childlike qualities of wonder, of curiosity, of openness, and of daringness that allow us to live more fully, to be a little bit more playful, and to be way more joyful in the way we live and lead forward. And in this season of giving, there is no better time than right now to pre-order a copy of In Awe. The book is going to remind you what we once so freely enjoyed and how returning to it will positively transform our communities, our organizations, our families, and our lives. For a limited time, I'm including an interactive copy of In Awe, the playbook with all pre-orders. This In Awe playbook provides hours of activities giving you the opportunity to start implementing some of the lessons as you joyfully await May 2020's release of the book In Awe. So my friends, I encourage you right now to hit pause on the podcast and visit me right now online. Here we are. Visit me at www.readinawe.com. I'm going to say that one more time. I want to make sure you are able to visit me. So here we go. www.readinawe.com. Go there today and pre-order your copy of In Awe to ensure your In Awe playbook is delivered before the holiday season. Again, it is readinawe.com. You're going to love the playbook. You are going to love the book. And after you read it, you're going to even more so love your life. Get ready for it, my friends. And now, on to today's episode. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Are you happy? Do you like your job? Most people report that they're not overly happy in life and they're not overly wild about their job. But a big part of that is the challenges with people around them. And in steps our guest today. His name is Michael Brenner. He has been recognized as a Forbes top CMO influencer. He's a top business keynote speaker by the Huffington Post. He's a top motivational speaker by Entrepreneur Magazine. He's CEO of the Marketing Insider Group. He's also the author of two best-selling books, including most recently the one that I am just finishing up called Mean People Suck. How Empathy Leads to Bigger Profits and a Better Life. My friends, you are going to be in for a treat during this episode as we talk to Michael, not only about his 53 jobs that has led him to this clarity, but about ultimately what it means for you and your jobs, in your relationship, and in your life. So during this podcast, I encourage you right now to open wide your hearts, open up your minds, whether they're focused on business or relationship right now. Take some notes. You're going to enjoy this one. And uh, welcome to our podcast, our newest friend, his name, Michael Brenner. Michael, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. John, thanks so much for having me. Man, this was an effort to get this on because you are so unbelievably busy after the launch and the successful reception of your book. What's it been like having this new book out there? 
Yeah, the reaction has just been, you know, you, you burst these books out into the world, and this is my second one, and, you, you know, you hope and pray people are going to like it, and it's just been overwhelming. You know, TV, radio, uh, requests for interviews, and, and uh, uh, but I got to say, I, I have been looking forward to talking to you more than anyone else, because... <laughs> You have just uh, just inspired so many people. You have such a great story, and it's an honor to, to be talking to you. Well, take that. Good morning, America. Michael prefers <laughs> the Live Inspired podcast. You heard it here first. That's right, John. So I've been a follower of yours for a while professionally. The book that you wrote gave me an insight into you personally. And so that, that's been a lot of fun to get to see the other side, and I think really candidly, even the better side. Oh. Talk about the title. I, I love yeah. it. Uh, mean yeah. People Suck. How empathy yeah, leads man. to bigger profits and a better life. They what? do, don't they? You know, <laughs> it's funny. I, you know, I wrote this book probably three years ago in my head, and and then I spent about two years putting words on paper, and uh, and I had a number of titles, and I was talking about leadership and innovation, and 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 I actually landed on the empathy formula, and I sent it to a really good friend of mine who uh, is is famous for being candid and brutally honest. Mm. And, you know, her text to me after she read it was, you know, friends don't let friends write bad books. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so I, I found somebody actually is a guy who was a playwright and, and has been really successful and has, has actually written plays that, that you have heard of and, and many of us know. And we just brainstormed and we were talking about the core problem and we were talking about the real gut wrenching emotions of you know, why I wrote the book. And mm-hmm. he's like, you're really trying to figure out why mean people suck so much. Mm. And, and I'm like, there's the title. And the whole rest of the book just fell into place. Well, and the title, when I first got the book, I assumed it was an older book because I, I really felt like I'd already read it. And then I saw your name at the bottom. I could not believe that that title, that that kind of sweet spot hasn't already been spoken to. You own it. You owned it. It's beautifully mm-hmm. done. Talk about the word empathy. It's the second word in your subtitle, but it's really about what yeah. this book, it's really not about mean people sucking. It's really about how do you, how do you, how do you flip the switch, not be yeah. like them, and how do you ensure that we become successful and significant in life? It's a double-edged sword, right? It's a word that people are using quite a bit now. And at the same time, I just got so many eye rolls from folks when I started talking about it. And, you know, I'm a keynote speaker and I present to business people and, and, you know, I don't, I don't give the kind of inspirational talks I think as much as you have, but the the folks that I'm talking to need help. And, you know, I bring up like empathy is the answer. And I see people check their phones and they're, they're, (laughs) they're checking out, their eyes are rolling. And so I couldn't leave with that. And that's why I knew I needed a hook, like mean people suck. And, but the real trick, the real trick that I found in, in researching companies and individuals who went from a place of dissatisfaction, uh, a place of feeling like they were victims of mean cultures, mean bosses, mean spouses even, the, the journey that they took out of that dark place was not looking inside themselves, but looking at how they could serve others. Mm. You know, you're an example of that, John. It's, it's how, do you, how do you go from, you know, something that, that, you know, anyone else could look at and say, I don't think I could do that. It's, it's you lo- you're looking at other people. It's empathy for others, service to others that allow us to get what we want. And it's, it's just, it's counterintuitive, but it's what the data showed me. It's what the research showed me. There's, you know, some great stories I share in the book of folks that, you know, took that journey in, in a number of different personal and professional situations. And, and I'm, you know, I just uh, so inspired by them and, and hopefully the book is going to inspire some of your audience as well. You state it factually, but take a, a, a quick feel of the barometer in the room. Do you think empathy organizationally and in marriages and in singleness and around drive through lines and everywhere in life, do you think we <laughs> are improving or not as far as empathetic communities go? You know, it's the the data is very discouraging. Uh, you know, I, there's a, a study by the University of Michigan that continues to this day, and and they saw about a 40 point drop in empathy over the last 30 years. Significantly, though, in the last 20 or so, and the biggest drop came in just the last 20 years. Now right. it's starting to flatten out, believe it or not. But but the fact is that we are much much less empathetic and. I think the, the net result of that is we feel like society's gotten a little bit meaner. You know, we can look at why, why has that happened? And, 
you know, there's a number of situations that we could point to, but, you know, I think the digital, social, mobile technologies, you know, we're all, we're, we all have relationships with our phones mm-hmm. and uh, it's kind of a joke, but it's sad that, you know, we, we can break up with our boyfriend or girlfriend or our wife, yeah. you know, or, or, or husband, unfortunately now just using our phone. And, and so technology has, has brought us together, but it has also allowed us to be a little less polite, a little less empathetic. You know, you wouldn't say the same things to somebody when you're sitting across the table as you might on text. And and so I think we're starting to, as a, as you know, as a society, as a species, starting to figure out, well, how do we get back to where we once were, where we felt connected and where we felt the kinds of, you know, uh, relationships that were being built on just simple means like, you know, being kind and thinking of others and the golden rule. You know, it sounds so trite in so many ways, and yet we've lost it somehow. You write at great length and with great passion, it's beautifully done in the book, about various leaders who are exhibit A of models of empathy in action. I'm curious though, growing up, who was your finest example of someone who was wildly empathetic? You may not have even known what that word meant when you were a kid, but looking back on it, now that you're kind of an expert in this space, who was that example to you, Michael? I think like for most of us, it was my parents. And, and, I grew up one of four, and uh, I tell the story in the book of how, you know, I, I needed a new pair of sneakers for the basketball team, and my parents at at twelve said, "Go get a job," <laughs> and I went and got a job, and that was the first of fifty three. I tell that <laughs> right. sort of story in the book, you know. And, and at first, I thought, "How you know, this is awful," you know, like how how superficial of me, right, to be to be depressed over the fact that I I couldn't afford a seventy dollar pair of sneakers or whatever it was, but. But, uh, you know, I, I looked back over the course of my childhood and started to realize that uh, my parents were struggling, man. They had bills and my dad lost his job at one point and my mom had to go back to work and, you know, she was cleaning houses for God's sake. And, you know, and I look back and I thought, you know, they did everything for us. They would have done anything to keep us clothed and keep us, you know, going to the Catholic schools that we went to. And they really were and, and continued, you know, my mom, my dad has passed, but my mom continues to be just, a, you know, the ultimate example of empathy for me. And if nothing else, it just teaches me, I think, to be the same way with my own kids, mm. if nothing else. Parenting is incredibly easy. Leadership is incredibly easy until you become one. <laughs> you know, your mom <laughs> no and dad, were, they were terrible parents until you have your own four little babies and That's then you exactly recognize right. how remarkable they were. So let's talk about those 53 jobs. We heard about job number one, started yep. at age 12. Michael, uh-huh. you're not that old of a man and yet you've had 53 <laughs> jobs, man. So uh, <laughs> w- was there one looking back on it since you made that sheet of all the jobs you've had? Was there one that was in one way or another most transformational for you? Yeah, there was one. I shared the story in the book. It's the one time I got fired and and, uh, you know, the, fu- the funniest story I, I relate to is that I, I was hired at, uh, I think, 17 to, uh, for a, a national pizza chain that still exists today. They stuck me in a broom closet and told me to watch four hours of VHS video on how to be a good pizza maker or whatever it was. Right. <laughs> and I, you know, and I walked out and, and it's the only job I ever walked out of for a short period of time. So that, that was sort of step one. But the, the one that I really spent some time on in the book, and I actually start and close the book with yeah. the story was uh, was where I got fired. And, you know, and I don't hold any ill will towards the, towards the individual who was behind the story, but the situation was one where I was let go. And make a long story short, a week later, I was called back. And in that course of that week, I was living with my in-laws. We were building a new house. I had a new baby and my wife was pregnant with number two. <laughs> yeah. And it was I, like, I remember sitting in the parking lot after getting let go and thinking how this can't happen now. It was probably the lowest most humbling moment of my life. And they hired me back. And, and what, what I learned after a couple of weeks was there was this individual and her name was Libby. And there was another individual and her name was Michelle. And there was another guy and his name was Brian. And, and these people had gone to the head of the company and said, you know, what happened here was wrong. And they fought for me. And they ended up firing the guy who fired me right. uh, for, you know, not just for what he did with me, but for other reasons as well. But uh, it taught me that, you know, when you really focus on helping other people that, you know, you, you create connections, you create friends, friendships, and those friendships can really come around when you need them. And that's what happened for me. And that was the transformation. And that's why, 
you know, I talk about in the book in, in organizations, you know, if there, if there are business leaders out there or, or, or leaders of any kind of a movement of, or organization, I talk about how we got to get rid of this, this sort of idea of the organizational chart. Yes. The boxes and lines that tell sort of allow egos to sit in high places, it just no longer functions. It no longer works in today's world. And, you know, I, I propose something I call the bullseye. It's, it's the organization that just asks what's in it for, you know, the, cur- the customer or the person that we're serving. Well, you know, why are we going to do uh, project A or invest in option B when, you know, we haven't really thought through how much impact it's going to have on the individuals we're trying to serve. And what's interesting when you ask that question in organizations, and I'm, I'm helping a number of organizations through this right now, is they start to realize it's their people that that make the difference. And so when we start by focusing on the people we serve, we start to realize we need other people, we need networks, we need communities to come together to serve that person or to serve the, you know, that customer group. And, and so it's really been transformational. That was the message that I received, you know, sort of <laughs> from on high. You know, I wasn't conscious. I wasn't thinking mm. consciously that I was there to help other people. But because I did, uh, they they came and you know, sort of helped me out, got me, got me hired back to this company. We ended up doing great things together, but it took me a while to realize that that was a lesson. There's so many bullets that you brought up there that we could spend a lot of time unpacking, and we're going to go through just a couple of them. The, the mm-hmm. first is the idea of you being a servant leader, pouring into these individuals when you lost your job, I think somewhat unfairly, and it was proven that way over time, that the people you'd invested in become the ones that become the heroes of the day. That's right. And right. I, I, that idea of personal empowerment, like it's still in play. There's still opportunities for, in quotes, ordinary individuals to yeah. take on heroic roles, but you got to mm-hmm. show up. You got to show up. And, and then the second piece, and you brought it up already, the organizational chart, everybody's favorite yeah. uh, flow chart in our systems. <laughs> you show a picture in your book and it shows, <laughs> I mean, I've seen a million of these in the organizations we partnered with. They're almost nonsensical how complicated they are. And you show it, and then you show it what it could look like. And at the one you say, this is what the bullseye approach looks like. Yeah. You take the org chart, you kind of flip it on its side, you spin yeah. it into a circle like you would uh, if you were throwing darts at a board. And yeah. right there in the middle, in your in your bullseye approach, Michael, what's in the middle of your bullseye? It's it's the customer. It's the end end user of of you know whatever the the ultimate audience that you're trying to help. You in the book call out that this is the way to build empathy. Tell me why that is. Yeah, because I think, um, you know, when we, at least in a professional environment, I think we think our, our job is to serve the person above us. You know, that's why the org chart really doesn't work. And, and I think even in life, I think sometimes we think our job is to, is to, is to do what's best for us. Um, but when we flip it, when we start to say, wait a second, I'm, I'm here not to serve the, you know, the guy or the, or the, or the woman that's, that I report to, but the person that is the reason there's a, a, a man or a woman ahead of me on the org chart and that's the customer, you know, and I, I, I show a kind of a, a fun, um, and we'll share the audiobook uh, companion guide with your audience, if that's okay. Yeah, awesome. So they can see this, but, but there's a sort of a cartoon in the book I share of what, a, what the, what a real org chart would look like. And it, the real org chart is people that are having affairs and people that are doing drugs and people whose kids go to school together and people, you know, there's the guy who runs the office lottery pool. And, you know, it's all this kind of stuff that, that you would expect to see when real people get together. Mm. And yet, we forget the most important person. Any organization exists to serve a customer. Any organization, you know, exists to serve other people. And we forget to highlight that in, in any way. And so that's what I tried to do with the bullseye is just, you know, show what's really true. And that is that the company would not exist. An organization doesn't exist if it didn't have a, a purpose, a mission, an end goal of serving other people. So I, I completely agree with you. I loved it. And uh, I'm going to steal it shamelessly. I'll give you credit for it. But I I really think the idea of putting the customer, putting the child, putting the student, putting the patient, putting the whomever right there at the very center of legal, HR, IT, janitorial, like boom, it makes us Mm -hmm. front and central. What actually, why are we all at work in the first place? So I'm going to share with you a couple quotes that I wrote down from your book and you tell me what they mean. Cool. Bureaucracy kills great ideas. I call it the great idea cycle of death. And it's, it, you know, it starts with, you know, a, a, a man or a woman sitting in their garage and they come up with a great idea and, and, and somebody wants to buy that. And then they form a company 
And, and what happens around that company is bureaucracy. And bureaucracy kills the exact environment that the garage that, you know, that man or woman was sitting in, you know, thinking through how to solve a problem. And, and so the, the great idea cycle of death is we have a great idea that generates some sort of a positive impact on the world. Um, that positive impact causes a whole bunch of people to want to join up and figure out, you know, processes and formal functions and, and steps and red tape that prevent us from doing that, that original, you know, solving that original problem. Mm. And so we need to break through that. that. That's the, that's the challenge. It's, that's the cycle that causes mean people to suck. So give me an idea of how I can bust through that. So if, if I'm dealing yeah. with this in my family, in my synagogue, in my church, mm -hmm. in a little study group, in a large organization, how do we begin breaking through the walls that separate us? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have to lean on a number of other great minds that have already answered this question, and, and I refer to some of them in the book, but there's uh, Simon Sinek's the, the Power of Why. He wrote a great book on, on just, you know, just asking why is a really powerful tool. Um, I present a couple of, you know, simple questions. I call it the pushback, but it's just, you know, who is this for? What's the impact that we think it's going to create for them, and how are we going to measure it? And I think if we ask those questions, we would see a lot of, of the inefficiencies, a lot of the just the really dumb ideas that are being put out into the world. Um, they would go away, and, and or we would see that they're blatantly serving the ego of an individual hmm. as opposed to the audience that we're trying to serve in your church or synagogue or organization or family. Well, speaking of the, uh, the ego, the next quote I wrote down, you're like leading me perfectly down this path. Be <laughs> behind every bad idea is an executive who asked for it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Tell me why you wrote that. What does it mean for us? So that was a question I got. Uh, you know, and, and like I said, I do I do a bunch of keynote speeches, and and um, I sp speak a lot to marketers and salespeople, and you know, and I and I I usually start all my presentations with you know your whatever you're doing sucks, <laughs> and <laughs> and I break the audience down, and then I try to build them back up. It's you know, it's I have to get people you know in the gut and in their heart before I can you know get them in their head, and and so I was doing that, and, and a couple of years ago, and somebody said, why do we do all that stuff? And I didn't have a great answer. Answer, um, at the time. And, you know, just a little bit of reflection, I thought, you know, in all the 53 jobs I had, you know, why did I do the stuff that didn't really work? And, and it, it wasn't necessarily that I was pointing the finger at, you know, my boss or, or a, another individual, but almost all of the stuff that I did that I hated doing that I knew wouldn't work, but we ended up doing anyway was because someone else told me to. And so I, I came up with that line, and John, you'll appreciate this. I, I speak to a lot of folks that have their phones out and they're active on Twitter, and mm -hmm. it, it's blown up on Twitter a few times. And so I thought I need to say this every time I speak to people, right? <laughs> because it, heads start nodding, people you know laugh. Sometimes they cry. They always get it that that you know it's not necessarily about pointing fingers. Um, it's really about understanding that this is the irony of mean people suck. We can say mean people suck all day long and we can relate to it, but your situation, your misery, you know, it, your lack of engagement in your job or your, or your, your, you know, marriage or whatever relationship we're talking about isn't going to change until you take accountability. Right. And so, you know, I start with that, you know, sort of depress, depressing joke. And then I turn right around and I say, but if you're miserable in your job, if you don't like the situation you're in in life, you're the only one that can change it. We can't sit around and be victims and wait for someone else to, you know, come along. And, and, and that's why I think empathy is the sort of the, you know, it's the bus that we can get on to take us out mm. of those dark and lonely places. Well, sometimes the individual in front of us makes it very difficult for us to be empathetic. So this next quote, yeah. I think, speaks to that. The customer is not always right, but they should always be heard. And so, mm -hmm. Michael, how do we as human beings receive that negative feedback, that critique, when our natural reaction, whether it's in marriage or sales or behind a counter or as a nurse, as a teacher, whatever position it might be in, is to punch back or to ignore or to argue? Like, how, <laughs> how, you know what I mean? Like, how do we receive yeah. what we don't agree with without yeah. wanting to fight yeah. back about it? Yeah, I mean, well, it's a couple of things. I mean, one is I, I, I tell a story of, there's a couple of folks I was having dinner with and they were complaining about, you know, this airline did that. And this one time I was stuck on the, you know, on the, on the runway. And this one time was a thunderstorm and, and, you know, and, and I, I'm just not one to complain about things I can't control. Right. And, and I was making the point to these folks that, um, you know, behind every one of these sort of, 
you know, bad experiences I think we have in customer service, you know, whether it's at the supermarket or the, or at the airline, it's generally not psychopaths, right? We're not talking about, you know, narcissists that are running around ruining society. It's, it's generally, it's a person just like us having a really bad day, or it's a person just like us who has a, you know, a job that has to deal with really nasty people all the time. Yeah, can imagine. And I think if, if we just think of those situations, that's in the, in the book, I have uh, three sort of takeaways. It's be kind, be cool, be you. And this is the be cool part. Like we can't take it personally. And I think that's the problem. We, we, the reason we want to fight back is we take, I think sometimes negative situations, you know, and I, I can recall one where I, I had a senior executive at, a, at a early, one of my early jobs completely lose his temper on me. And I, I had a, a really great mentor and boss who I'm, I continue to be friends with today who, who pulled me outside at the break and he said, that wasn't about you. You know, it, it's just be cool. Right. <laughs> He's right. like, just be cool. And don't take that personally. That had nothing to do with you. I didn't, I don't even think I said anything in the meeting, but uh, it was just, it was, you know, it's, I think sometimes we just take it personally and we forget that it's real people with real jobs and real stresses and kids at home and, you know, parents that are sick or whatever it may be. And we just forget that. And I think, you know, that's why sometimes, you know, Twitter and Facebook and our texts uh, make that harder to see. But when we think through those things, and we start to realize these are, these are good people. You know, these are people just like us that are just having a bad day. So I, I agree with you the vast majority of the time. Sometimes it is someone hiding behind a screen or they're having a bad day or whatever else it may be, or they don't really know you and you don't really know them. How, how do you handle when you, you mentioned the boss who went off on you, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't your deal and, and your friend said, hey, be, be cool. What happens if that happens again the following day? And, and, yeah. Or the following day, and speak to those of us who have a difficult roommate, or a challenging spouse, yeah. or a very difficult yeah. child. How, how do yeah. we not only be cool, but begin to redeem the challenge in the first place? Yeah, well, and that's the third step, and that's be you. I mean, I think at some point, you know, with to be kind, um, that's the first step uh, out of dark situations. I think often, um, be cool is is don't take the, the stuff that happens to us sometimes uh, personally. But at some point, yeah, you know, if you're in an abusive relationship, you, you know, that's not a that's not a good place for anybody. And uh, and I think that's where, you know, knowing who you are and what you value uh, is is really, it's kind of you know, this is this is not one on one. Um, and I'm not a psychotherapist, but right. but but I I kind of leave the book um, in the final chapter with this this concept of of ikigai, which I hadn't heard of before. Uh, I was explaining this to someone, this brilliant brilliant professor, um, who who told me about Dan Buettner's book or Blue Zones, and where he explains an ikigai is a it's a Japanese term for your life's purpose. And uh, I had been presenting this topic of sort of the intersection between what you like to do or what you love to do, what the world wants and what the world will pay you for. And, and it's basically, that's essentially what Ikigai is. Right. It's this, you know, it's, it's where the intersections of what you love to do, what you're good at and what the world really wants or needs. Um, you know, the, the world doesn't need somebody sitting as a victim in an abusive relationship. And so, yeah, there's a point where, uh, you know, we need to leave, uh, you know, we need to stand up for ourselves and have some, have some self-confidence. That's not, that's, that's hard to do. It's not easy when, you know, I think we all have been in situations where we've taken it maybe a little too much. Um, so yeah. So when that executive shows up the second day and berates you, it's, it's time for him to leave or you to leave right. uh, or her. And, and, and so that's the, you know, that's the advice I give. And there are too many of us that are in that situation. Well, the, the challenges in life can kind of alter our life sometimes for the worse, other times for the better. And I've had the opportunity of partnering with Microsoft several times. And in the most recent, the leader brought me in and said, our, our big focus, our big focus is on creativity, collaboration, and then she used the word, ready? Empathy. Yep. Empathy. That's right. That's right. And you shared with me in your book, why? Mm-hmm. Now share with mm-hmm. our listeners why empathy is a big part of what Microsoft is doing these days. Yeah, and and I have a lot of good friends I mentioned in the book that work there, and and it's not a perfect company, but the folks that I know that are there really believe that the company puts empathy at the center of their culture, and it starts with their with their CEO Satya Nadella uh, when he took over, and I tell the story about how he, um, you know, he had a child with a lot of a lot of health issues and mental issues uh, when he was relatively young, and and it you know he talks about how that transformed him. And realized that you know there's more to life than working 12 hours a day at a technology company, and uh, and then he started thinking, well, you know, but why do we go to work and forget our humanity? 
uh, and you know, and and I don't, I don't go too deeply into his personal story. Other folks have done that, but but he did really try to bring that culture of empathy to Microsoft, and and he talks about how they went from a culture of of kind of know it all, uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, they thought they knew it all, to a culture of learn it all, uh, which mm-hmm. I thought was just a just a great way to turn the focus, you know, in subtle ways from you know, hey, uh, we're smart, you know, we're awesome, <laughs> we're the we're the you know at the time maybe the largest. Uh, company in the world to wait. We don't know everything. We're not. We're not the best. We have a long way to go. Every one of us are on our you know own paths of trying to figure things out. And and so he slowly started to do that. Uh, he talks about it. I saw him speak twice this year at at different conferences, and he brought up empathy and culture as the core reason why they've done well. Mm-hmm. And and he talked about the different programs that they they implement. For example, they. They try to make sure that there's a, a fairness in the way that people are hired and fired and promoted. Um, I, I, I referenced a study that said that that was more important to employees than their pay and their benefits. That they just want to see they just want to see good people get, get promoted. Right. Do the right <laughs> you know, thing. They want to see good people. Yeah, get, get, want to see good people get hired. And uh, you know, and, and that's what Satya has done. And, and again, like I said, there's anecdotes out there in the world. You know, since I've been talking about it, I've seen. Uh, uh, where they're not perfect, and he fully admits that they have, you know, it's a journey for them. But uh, I think it's an inspiring story. Um, it's an inspiring story from a from a CEO, uh, and I tell another inspiring story from, uh, um, you know, the head of Lego who took over as a thirty year old consultant. Man, so, but there's almost the entire yeah. conversation. You've been one step ahead of me. Like I, I try to have really free flowing <laughs> conversations, but essentially on a napkin, I'll write yeah, like yeah. eight bullets. Like I need to cover these eight things if if we have time. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, every single time about, I'm about ready to step into the next bullet, you steal it, man. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to insist that you steal the bullet around Legos because I think it's a story. First of all, any one of us who have children have had the experience of tucking our kids in, walking into the room at nighttime, and then screaming loudly in pain as we step on one of those dang Legos. So like we, we've all purchased them and been broken and bruised because of them. Mm-hmm. But you share with me why they are not in bankruptcy and why they're as successful as they are today. So share the story, if you don't mind, of Jorgen yeah, no. Vig Nudstrop. That's right. Yeah, not easy to say. Uh, but uh, the Danish, you know, young Danish guy was working as a consultant there for just about two years. And was asked to give a you know sort of state of the business presentation to their board, and he walked in and made a decision to be honest, uh, which you know I think I, interestingly you know I think uh, I know a lot of folks in the business world that have to do those kinds of presentations, and more than not they they present what they think people want to hear, and and, mm. and Jurgen decided to do the opposite. He walked in, and he said, listen, at the current rate we're broke, we're going to be out of business, uh, and it's going to happen faster than than you might think. And uh, he gave the presentation, he, ha- he added a couple of, of ideas for how they could turn things around, ideas that had already been presented by, you know, half a dozen other people. Uh, and he called his wife and said, I think I'm going to be fired. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, and, and he got a call the next day and said, uh, not only are you not going to be fired, we want you to be CEO. And, um, and he really turned the company around. And, and you know, I think I, I say in the book that he's not the hero of the story. The hero of the story is the board uh, who, who gave him that opportunity the hero of the story is his marketing team, his sales uh, folks, some uh, you know lifetime passionate employees around the company that did Herculean heroic things to save the company. Um, and, and at the center of it all was their their mission. Lego means uh, I didn't know this when I when I saw the story. Yeah, Lego cool. means play well in Danish. They had product team members go spend six weeks living with with families just to see how kids are playing. They did focus groups to see which Legos girls play with versus, you know, boys to see if they were really focusing on, you know, meeting the needs of, of young girls in the way that they play. And they do play differently in some cases. And, and just there's, you know, story after story of the things that he did to focus Lego on how kids play well. Because prior to that, Lego was focusing on how do we grow and how do we hit the new markets and how do we add a new color and add a new line. And, you know, it's just this classic great story of, of, a, of a young person who wasn't the leader of an organization who presented the truth, the hard mm. truth, and was given an opportunity to turn the company around. And, and in doing so, you know, was focusing on serving people. <laughs> it's just it's a great story. Well, it is cool. And, and to see how they use their community, to see mm-hmm. how even the Lego movie kind of grew out of this idea of, what, yeah. what, what if we tried this? What if we tried that? And that, that, that's right. These people who don't have all the answers, but they have all the questions. I think that that is the way to move forward, whether you are running Lego or you're running a household of one. That's right. 
one of the questions you love, do you champion your employees' ideas? Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask it again because I want to make sure our listeners are, are, are tuning in for this one. Do you champion your employees, your spouses, mm-hmm. your children, your grandchildren, your parents, your neighbors? Do you champion those around you, their ideas? Why is that question so important? Well, it changes the, it changes the whole tone of the conversation. And, and it, it's, it's certainly true, I think, in a business context, right? When you've got an employee and a manager, um, you know, and I have been, I, I want to say, you know, a pretty significant portion of my manager employee relationships were all about, Hey, what are you working on? Uh, you know, do this instead. Um, I want to hear what you're doing. Um, status report kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in relationships is a little bit different because you're, you know, you should be co-equal, <laughs> you know, friends and mm-hmm. spouses, we should be thinking of ourselves as equal partners. But, uh, but even in those situations, um, this, the champion leadership idea is, is really just, how can I help you? You know, how are you doing? You know, it's like <laughs> when I meet somebody, I don't say, Hey, I'm awesome. You should know me. You should become my good friend. You know, I say, hey, you know, my name is Mike, and and how are you? You know, <laughs> what do you do? Where do you live? You know, you got any kids? Like we we ask questions when we want to get to know people and to form a relationship, and and why don't we do that in the business context? And and God, so many of us forget. I even I, you know, I say in the book, even I suck sometimes. <laughs> we all do. Forget. You know, we think uh, I'm I'm sad. I'm depressed. I I'm hungry. <laughs> I need you know a burger. I need a hug. I need something from someone else. And again, when we have empathy, we realize that we can fill ourselves up, you know, just by by asking how we can help other people. So, Mike, I got two questions for you before we we shift gears into what we call the Live Inspired Seven. The mm-hmm. the first is when you're having one of those days, and it is a day that every one of us, Mike, John, and everyone else tuning in right now, has had, where you're just done. You're at the end of the line. You're being rained on without a jacket. The traffic is backed up. Like everything is going wrong. How do you go from sucking, to use the language from your book, mm-hmm. how do you go from being a victim to it to pivoting into what remains possible? Like what, what are some ideas yeah. that we can leverage going forward? Yeah, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I went out on my own, a 25-year corporate person, and, and went out on my own and started my own business. And the very first thing I did was to write a mission statement. And, and not like some foofy thing that didn't mean anything. I really tried to understand, why am I doing this? And, and I, you know, when I looked back at my 53 jobs, I realized the times that I was happy and the times that I, I was able to struggle through those those roles where I wasn't happy was because I had some high, some sort of a higher purpose in mind. And, and I offer up in the book, a, a, a very simple recipe, as I call it for defining a mission statement. And, and it's who, what, and why, mm-hmm. who are we serving? You know, who, who are you serving? What's the sort of the area that you are interested in, have passion around, have some, some ability to affect change. And how can, how can you measure that result? How can you sort of feel like you're, you're making an impact in the world? And those are the things that I think, you know, have helped me out of dark places. When you just think through revisiting that mission, that purpose, some people call it, uh, you know, that, that's my advice. And, and it's always 100% about other people. It's not, I decided I needed to make a million dollars and I'm at 900 grand and I have a hundred grand to go. Like, that's not the story I'm, I'm telling. <laughs> Exactly. So w- when you spend the years thinking through and then praying over and then writing and then burning the pages you just wrote and then doing it again and again and again until you finally get a cover and a title and a subtitle and content that you love and you want to promote and you want to pitch, when they get to the end of the book, when we finish reading it, w- what's one thing that you hope we know about ourselves or our lives? Yeah, it's it. we have a choice. And like I said, the, the mean people suck title is is irony in itself because – we not we nod our heads, and it's so funny how many people say, "Yeah, they really do." It's the it's the immediate reaction to almost everybody I say the name of my book to, and then I start to see their eyes sort of shift back of their heads a little bit or look up to the left, because I know that they're thinking the thing that I was thinking when I first heard the title, and, and then it's wait a minute, do I suck? Oh yeah, right on. <laughs> you know, so um, I and think by the way, the answer is yes. We <laughs> all do from time to time, right. and, it, and we're great at calling it out in others, but not always seeing it in ourselves. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and so it's a choice. That's it. You know, we have a choice. You know, we don't have to be victims of any of it. And so that's the one thing I'd love for people to walk away from. What a worthwhile message in a marketplace that 
loves talking about the bad things, but seldom mm-hmm. has people moving toward the solutions toward them. You you gave us that choice. It's a powerful book. I really enjoyed it. I think my favorite part was the organizational chart, actually. I know that's <laughs> kind of lame and boring, but whether you run a business like I do and many of our listeners do, or you run a household, making sure that you have yeah. what is actually important at the middle of the circle matters. That's right. Uh, So, Mike, at the end of every podcast, we ask seven questions of our guests. We call them the Live Inspired Seven. Here we go, man. What is the best book you've ever read? It's a little bit wonky. It's a little bit nerdy, I guess. But uh, Joseph Campbell, The Power of Myth. Uh, I was an English lit major at St. Joe's University in Philadelphia, and and it's the first book they they assigned me to read. Briefly, I mean, Joseph Campbell was a professor, and, and what he looked to try to figure out is, are, is there common elements to the stories that we've seen in the, in the course of humankind? And and he looked at societies that never talked to each other, you know, so Aborigines in Australia and Western Europeans and South Americans, organizations, right. groups that never talked to each other. And he found that they all follow the same exact pattern. And we all now know it as the hero's journey, which, uh, which George Lucas used uh, yes. almost, almost exactly to write Star Wars. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's the most effective way to tell a story. So I kind of nerd out about the storytelling part, but the cool thing I think for humanity is, you know what? We don't realize the forces that sort of pull us together. For those who don't know what the hero journey is, give, give us a couple of the high and low water marks for what it is. Cause you know, every single Disney cartoon, every single yeah, cart, like, right. it all, it all wraps itself around the hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey, Mike? Yeah, so you've got you've got a hero who is is usually forced on a journey they don't want to go on, and you can think you know you can always think of Mark Hamill in, in Star Wars. So you've got Luke Skywalker is you know he's trying to go to I don't know the flight school, but instead uh, Obi Wan Kenobi shows up and makes him jump on a ship to go save a princess, right? Mm-hmm. So there's there's a mentor. There's usually a mentor involved. Obi Wan Kenobi's the mentor. Um, there's a villain, uh, which is kind of cool, right? So the villain of, who's the villain of your story is a, is a great question to ask. I think ourselves. Um, obviously, in in Star Wars, it was it was Darth Vader. Um, so the hero goes on a journey he didn't expect with a mentor he didn't you know hadn't met before, and faces the darkest demons. And for Luke, it was you know is he is he going to fall into the same trap his father mm-hmm. did and, and go to the dark side? Um, the hero emerges from that uh, sort of uh, you know introspection completely transformed. And then, in many ways, uh, usually returns home, and that's kind of the rich, that's the hero's journey, sort of in a circular format. And the cool thing about the hero's journey is now that you've heard that, every single time you find yourself mm-hmm. with kids, grandkids, nephews, nieces watching a show, you're going to be watching the hero's journey. There, sure. There's nothing new under the sun. Those are three thousand year old words, and they still <laughs> play true today. Mm-hmm. What's one positive characteristic, one trait that you possessed as a child that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today, Mike? Ooh, um, fear. I, I was unabashedly a, a afraid of everything. <laughs> I think as we grow up, I think we we learn to hide our fears. But it's you know, there's a lot to learn from the things that we're afraid of, and and so. Uh, you know, sometimes I look back and I think, God, I was such a scaredy cat. I was scared of the dark. I was scared of bigger kids. I was scared of girls. I was scared of <laughs> giving presentations uh, in school, scared that my friends didn't like me anymore. Like all of those things are the things that helped me grow up. Mm-hmm. And and I think we we push those down. We push them away as adults. And, you know, I, I just I had a, a moment with my son this morning where I was talking about my best friend's spouse. He's he's gay, and and his spouse is turning forty. And I sent him a birthday card. And I was telling my son about my friend's husband, and his questions were, "Oh, that's cool. So does forty make you old?" Like his questions weren't about the situation right. that you know I was a little bit nervous about. You know, explaining. He was just about, hey, you know, this guy's turned forty. Wow, is that old? Like, are they doing anything fun? Are they going on a big trip? Like, and it was just, it's sometimes we forget, I think, and we let we let the being old get in the way of just learning what we need to learn in life. In a similar story, we, my wife and I are big brothers and big sisters, and we had our little brother over recently, and all of our nephews, all of our nieces were there. They'd never met our little brother before, and they were playing hide and seek. Our little brother's mm-hmm. African American. My name is John O'Leary. Okay, like so, I'm I am <laughs> Lily White. Our little brother is, is a little bit different than everybody else out playing hide and seek, and they can't find him. And one of the little girls comes in, and she goes, "Where where is he? We can't find him." And I was playing dumb. I said, "Find who?" And she goes, "You know the boy." And I assume she would say his skin color. And she goes, yeah. "The boy with the red shirt. Where where, <laughs> where is he?" Yeah. Kids have this way exactly. of just seeing love, man. And so uh, yeah. I, I hear you exactly. loud and clear. 
Mike, yeah, it's a great story. If your home caught fire and all living things were out, your wife, your four kids, and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item that actually matters, what's the one thing you would grab? I'm just counting the kids and, and my wife, and, and I don't think I'm even thinking about a single thing. The, the, the first thing that popped into my head is, my, is just the picture of my wife and I walking down the aisle on our wedding day. Uh, so, Mike, if you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, who would you want to be seated right next to you? I, I'm going to go with Martin Luther King. You know, he's like a, the right voice for the generation, but his life story is just unbelievable. And it, I'm just completely inspired by the environment he, he grew up in, the, the person he became, and the fight that he led uh, with such compassion and, and empathy. What allowed him to turn what must have been rage into mm. such an effective form of change. That, that's the question that I kind of you know, struggle with, and, and I can't imagine someone better than him to ask that question to. And what a cool, not only conversation to have, but to realize as bad as things are today, in the context mm -hmm. of where we were in the 60s or where we were in the yeah. 1860s or the divisions we've had throughout the history of, of human civilization, Man, the foundation yeah. here is firm, and we got some things we got to yeah. work through and make better. But uh, yeah. MLK shows a bright light forward, so that's that's a great answer, yeah. Mike. What's the best advice you've ever received? So my dad had this little piece of paper on his uh, like his workbench. We live in Pennsylvania, about 25, 30 minutes away from Amish country and German Catholics, but definitely inspired by you know some of the Mennonites and, and the you know German populations that live just west of us. And uh, he had this thing. It was quit your belly aching. And it was all, it's all one word. And I can, I can picture it in my head because it was just a scrap he must have found somewhere. The advice from him was always, I could complain, but no, mm. one's, no one's gonna care. Just save it, you know, use your energy for good. And nobody likes a complainer. And my dad could have complained as much as anyone, but he didn't. He focused on, on, on raising us and keeping my mom happy and keeping a job that, you know, had left, left a roof over our head. So, uh, so he, he, was, he was a great can... example of, of that advice as well. That's, That's right. awesome. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? You know, I spent a lot of time in my 20s, like I think many of us, but, but really anxious. And I heard Ariana Huffington answer that same question this way, so I'm, I'm totally stealing it from her. But it was, uh, it's going to be okay. I wish somebody had told me that in a way that I believed it in my 20s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I could have never imagined, you know, to have a beautiful wife, great parents, four kids that are happy and healthy you know, a job that I think is a gift, uh, you know, for me. And, and so all those things that I was worried about then, um, you know, and who knows what life's going to bring, but that's what I wish I could tell my 20 year old self. Well, Michael Brenner, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? I'm going to say uh, either live your life in service of others, or I'm going to go with the subtitle of the book. And, that, and I'm going to add a few words, but empathy is the counterintuitive secret to success or, or focusing on others is the counterintuitive secret to success. And that's, that's the point that, I, you know, it's the, it's the thing that really drove me to write the book. Um, I think we're in a crisis of empathy. Companies are facing a crisis of engagement with their own employees. And most of the people I talk to hate their jobs and, you know, too many of us are, are unhappy in, in our relationships personally. And I, if one person can, you know, sort of see the light of, of what I think this message could be, then, you know, that's it. Well, my friends, Michael Brenner lived his life with empathy and in doing so led his four babies, his wife, and an awful lot of readers and followers to not only bigger profits, but to better lives. Michael, I want to thank you for writing the book and for living the message. John, thanks so much for having me. This has been a blast. It, for me as well. My friends, that is Michael Brenner. He is the author of the best-selling book, Mean People Suck, How Empathy Leads to Bigger Profits and a Better Life. It's available now. I encourage you to go out and check it out. I am John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired. My friends, thank you so much for listening to today's Live Inspire podcast. I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email at podcast at johnolearyinspires.com with your feedback, maybe your guest suggestions for future shows, stories on how this podcast has helped you live more inspired, or questions that you have for me. Again, send that email to me at podcast at johnolearyinspires.com. I can't wait to share with you the next episode.